Well, if I say the word mission, what generally do you think of? I think we probably, most people, fall into probably one of three categories. Uh, you may think of religious missions, the process by which someone uproots themselves and, and from everything that they know and immerse themselves in an unknown land, a foreign culture and a foreign country with a foreign language. Uh, they're, they, they just immerse themselves in, in some sort of work in, in God's name, completely different from their own context at home. If you are someone who enjoys uh, a spy novel now and then, you may think of the likes of James Bond or Mission Impossible, Get Smart, or Inspector Gadget, the kind of people that need to thwart the, the enemy and go on all sorts of covert missions to save the day. If you are more sci-fi minded, you may find this script running through your mind. Space. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's continuing mission to seek out new civilizations, to explore strange new worlds, and to boldly go where no one has gone before. In all of those things, the point is that the person, the spy, or the starship goes somewhere else and does activity over there. We never really think about mission in terms of our own context, do we? Our own everyday lives. A gospel reading is usually understood under the title, Jesus sends out the 72. A crowd of 72 followers of Jesus, they are sent out on a mission. And before they embark, Jesus gives them some marching orders, some, some instructions about the nature of that mission. These instructions are not about where they will go but it's about the people that they will meet and how they will interact with them. And I think in this case, we can see instructions into our own call to mission, our call to make known the kingdom of God. So I invite you to pick up your pew Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke is the third uh, gospel around with, about uh, Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So it's the second half of the Bible in the New Testament. As I said, mission is not necessarily about where we go, but it's about how we interact with the people around us. Gospel reading begins by Jesus appointing the 72. He sends them out ahead uh, to every town and place that he was about to go. Now, Jesus, at this point, he's on his way to Jerusalem. That's kind of where he's going. And so the places that he sends them to are places that would surround Jerusalem. Now, some of these places would be Jewish territory. Some of these places would be Gentile territory. That's why Jesus gives the instructions to eat whatever is set before you. Don't care about the laws and the restrictions and all that kind of stuff. Just eat what's before you. Importantly, however, about all these places, these places would have been somewhat familiar. The 72, even if they've never ventured into so-and-so town, they would have some familiarity and knowledge about the places they were about to go. Jesus doesn't send them on a deep mission, a deep incursion into foreign land. It's not kind of like Paul who jumps on a boat and goes to a completely different country. That's not what they're doing. They're going to the next town. Or they're going to the next province, basically. And yet, the mission which is in the context of the very own world is seeped in urgency. Verse 3, go, Jesus says. And that's emphatic. If you look in your text, you may have an exclamation mark after the go. That exclamation mark is a, an untranslated Greek word, which is emphatic in its emphasis. It is an imperative command that they focus their entire self on this one thing. Go, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. So often I think we think of the important missions in life as the ones that we go to in foreign places. When I was a youth worker, I led my youth group down to Tijuana on a mission trip. And it was seen as a very important thing. But sometimes we think of those things as, as important, and they are important, and we do good work. But we think that they are more important than our Christian life here. But there is just as much urgency to our Christian living, our missional living here, 
One of the key points of living within this mission is understanding that urgency. Do we have that urgency? Do we still have this inner feeling that it is imperative that we live out this sense of mission? That we do everything that we can do to help others accept and see the kingdom of God in their midst? Jesus portrays this earnest, this, this urgency. Take nothing with you. Don't meet anybody on the road. Just go on this, on this urgent mission. He says, the harvest is plentiful. You know, the urgency of the mission is not because the opportunities are so few. It's because there's so many. Jesus says that the 72, there are so many opportunities, so many doors that are open to convey the message of the kingdom, to bear the message of God's love and God's forgiveness and grace. The doors are open all over the place. And because there is such great opportunity, it is imperative that you, A, pray about this work, and then get to it. I love when Jesus says, you know, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into their field. And then he says, go into the field and do the work. Jesus kind of says, you know, pray about it and then be the answer to your very own prayer. I wonder, do we sometimes feel that there is no opportunity to live out the message of forgiveness and grace in this world? Do we think that the whole talk about evangelism and mission, well, it sounds very good from the pulpit, and it sounds very good from professional people who like to do that kind of thing, but uh, in our own world, well, there's just no opportunity. Jesus would say, wrong. Opportunities abound if you are just willing to enter into it. And so he sends out the 72 and says the opportunity is there. And notice, they don't know who they're going to talk to. All that they know is that they are sent and that they have a message. And what is that message? Verse 5, when you enter into a house, first say, peace to this house. It's a message of God's peace to you. And then verse 9, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near. The message is God's kingdom is upon you, is here. God is available even if they find people who are not hospitable to them. What are the 72 to do? Verse 11, they wipe off the dust from their feet as a testimony that that place wanted nothing to do with them or their message. And then they are to say, yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. The message is the same. It's the message of God's availability, of the grace of God that has come very, very near. It's not a condemning message. It's not a confrontational message. It's not an arrogant onslaught of Bible-thumping rhetoric. The message is the peace of God is available to you. The dynamic rule of God is near you. Now, yes, Jesus does talk about uh, the consequences of rejection of him. And it's great that our, you know, our lectionary likes to skip those verses where Jesus talks about that kind of stuff. And that he does talk about that. But notice, it's Jesus who bears the responsibility to talk to the people about their rejection. The 72 witnesses of God's grace and God's peace and God's kingdom, they are given the message of God's grace and God's kingdom and God's availability to all. Jesus does the rest. Through the manner in which we interact with people, accept people, serve people, the manifestation of the kingdom becomes apparent. We do more to usher people into faith by how we live out this kind of missional Christian life than any sort of religious debate or theological argument ever will do. But we also do more to damage people's acceptance of the kingdom by what we do and what we say than by any sort of answers that we may or may not have. Sometimes... We have all these fear about why we can't get into this kind of thing. We say, well, I don't have, I don't know who I'm supposed to talk to. Well, neither do the disciples. They didn't have any mind about people that they were going to speak to. Some people say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Neither do the disciples. They didn't have a plan. They just kind of went. We, like the disciples, like the 72, all that we need to do is A, affirm and accept that we are sent. 
by virtue of being a follower of Jesus and be accept the message that we have. Peace of God is near and the kingdom of God has come to you. And what do we see in verse 17? The 72 returned with much depression and anxiety over the inability to be perfect. No, that's not what it says. The 72 returned absolutely discouraged because they couldn't answer people's questions. No, that's not what it says. The 72 returned with joy. Now, Jesus instructed them on what to say when people rejected them. And so it's probably fair to assume that they had rejections. They had probably met people who were not hospitable. Some may have been polite. Some may have been rude. And in those cases, the disciples moved on to other homes and other people and other opportunities that awaited them. But those experiences didn't deter nor discourage them. And in the end, they came back to Jesus, filled to the brim with great joy over what they had experienced. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They came back on cloud nine over knowing that they lived out the kingdom of God in people's lives. Have you ever had an amazing experience that upon coming back to kind of people that you know, you just need to tell them. You just need to tell them about what you saw or what you experienced or, oh, you got to know about this. This is what happened. And you're so filled with joy that it just needs to get out. That's what the disciples come back with. They saw God at work in people's lives. They saw people's lives change. And there is no greater joy than experiencing God work in someone else's life. They say, I, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The mission that we engage in here has spiritual effects as we participate in the expansion of God's kingdom on earth. Something that we are all called to. And whenever in church circles we talk about this type of dynamic, that we are called by, you know, by which we're called to interact with people, people often express, again, a whole host of fears, a whole host of fears as why we don't engage in this type of missional living. It's, I don't know who to talk to. Again, you know, the, neither the disciples, but they waited. They waited for the opportunity to arise, and they trusted that God would lead them to the appropriate opportunities. They prayed to the Lord of the harvest that the Lord would send workers into the field. We may have the fear that, you know, we don't know enough. Well, neither did the 72. But in verse 19, Jesus says, I have given you authority. And that authority is not based on our own knowledge. It's not based on our own strength. It's based on the Lord of the harvest. Probably we have the fear that, you know what, I'll try this, but I'm going to fail. Well, the 72 probably did as well. In various circumstances. But they came back. They came back in awe. They came back encouraged. They came back filled with joy as they saw God move in people's lives. The fact is, our missional living, engaging in a mission by which we participate in the kingdom of God and other people's acceptance of it, is not based on our own ability. It's not based on our own competency. It's based on our willingness. And if we, like the 72, are willing to hear the urgency of that calling, not to go somewhere else, but to go to our own streets, our own houses, and our own towns, and our own cities, and bear this message, then I think that we, like the 72, will see heaven and earth move. We will see God interact dynamically with people. And in the end, we will be filled with great joy. And that joy will just spur us to do it again and again and again. Amen.